Well, thank you, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be doing this. I, two years ago, three years ago, 2007, we did our first jQuery conference here in Boston, and then we had 70 people show up. And so I think it's pretty amusing now to how the meetup has now eclipsed the actual conferences we're running. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today uh, about a couple of things. Um, it's pretty nice being able to talk to a group of people who already use jQuery, uh, since I can talk about some of the more uh, interesting things, instead of just going over like what are selectors and things like that. Um, so I, some of the things I wanted to talk about today are... New, are, are a mixture of things that are either new in jQuery that were added in a recent release, or things that um, we have had in the library for a while, but maybe we haven't done a very good job of talking about. Um, so that's sort of some of the things I want to talk about today. And then uh, at the end, I wanted to wrap up doing some, uh, some coding uh, to show you what's going on. Um, so to start, uh, the I'm sure everyone here is, is, uh, is at least familiar with the, with how you would uh, create elements in, in jQuery. Uh, jQuery, in addition to being able to accept selectors into the jQuery object, uh, also allows you to accept fragments of HTML. Um, and this is uh, uh, something that we've had for a while now. It's just a mapping for doing a, a, a create element, uh, a document create element. Um, you can do a more uh, advanced things. Like you know, once you have that element, you can start to manipulate it. You can Changes attributes, inject content into it, uh, attach event handlers, all sorts of things of that nature. Um, you, the way you've been able to do this traditionally in jQuery is just, you know, you use, use chaining. Um, you do a method, the method returns the jQuery set again. You do another method, and you just keep on doing that again and again. Um, in jQuery 1.4, uh, we added an alternative to that, uh, which is uh, if you have the original a uh, little HTML fragment there. Um, you can pass in an object as a second argument, and that object is all the, uh, all the things that you want to set on that element. So you can mix uh, attributes. So for example, you can have like ID or class name or stuff like that, and those attributes will get set. But you can also do things like bind uh, uh, event handlers, like click, or even call methods, like add class name. So we, we include all the getters and setters, well, all the getters, um, no, all the setters, sorry, all the setters in jQuery, um, uh, so that you can, you can go through and attach those. So you can have access like data, and I'm trying to think what other ones there are there, but yeah, they're all there. Uh, and so this makes it at least uh, easier, and you can, you can probably do some form of maybe um, basic templating with it. Uh, you know, take an object and manipulate it and inject it into future ones, things of that nature. So that's something that we like. Um, Another thing that people are, don't, aren't typically familiar with is, in jQuery, the concept of end, uh, the end method. Uh, so jQuery does have this chaining, where you can, again, it's one method after another after another. Um, but the thing is, is that once you start chaining all these methods, it can get kind of uh, challenging, uh, because uh, you know, it, it, the code becomes quite complex. One thing that a jQuery has that is rather unique is, is the end method. Because what happens in jQuery is that any time you do a traversal method, like find or parent or parents or previous or next, you know, any of those that you're traversing around the DOM, um, that changes uh, the jQuery object. It returns a new jQuery object with a new set of elements in it. But the important thing is that that new set of elements that's returned points back to the parent from which it came. So in this way, uh, what you can do is, so for example, here we create our initial uh, list item with an anchor inside. We find the anchor that's inside of it, since we're, we're just traversing inside this fragment that we're currently in. Uh, we manipulate it, we set the uh, ref, uh, we set the inner contents of it. But then here, here's the critical part, we call .n. Now what .n does is it pushes back off the stack. Since the, uh, the jQuery object has a reference to the object from which it came, that n, that n returns that object. So that, in that way, you can start to, you can, you can traverse back up to the original, the li, and then inject it into the, into the page. So technically speaking, this is a one-liner in, in that uh, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of method calls and there are, you know, it's all in a single statement. Um, I, I, I tend to break down my chaining like this into a more readable format. 
Uh, but in, in this way, I think uh, that end is particularly useful, uh, and it tends to make your code uh, much more expressive, I find. One nice thing about using dot end, in particular, is that it allows you to avoid having to save jQuery objects and variables. So for example, uh, another way to write this code, uh, we could have written, let me just uh, copy this here. Um, let me see. I'll just write it down here. We could have written something like this. We said if var li um, that, and then we could have said you know, li.find, and then li.append to. That, that would have been, that's, that's a roughly equivalent. It's not nearly as good looking. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't like having to have all these extra variables lying around when they're just not needed. Um, so I, at, at least in that way, I find it to be much more, again, much more expressive, and um, at least doesn't clutter your code so much. Um, another thing that we landed recently, and this isn't something that you particularly have to worry about in that it's just something that jQuery does, but it makes your code much faster. Um, so in jQuery, again, when you pass in uh, you know, your HTML, either to the jQuery object or if you're doing an append or a prepend or what have you, uh, in all those cases, we now uh, use document fragments in order to improve performance. And this is... Uh, this is interesting because we can use document fragments to do caching as well. Um, so to sort of back up and to explain what a document fragment is. So a document fragment is a relatively rarely used part of the DOM specification. And what a document fragment acts as is sort of like a very lightweight container for DOM nodes. So you can take this document fragment container and you can push some nodes into it and, it, and what's really nice about it, though, is that when it, ho when it holds these nodes, and when you insert the fragment, the fragment just sort of disappears. And what's inserted in place are the nodes that were inside the fragment. Um, it, it's this, it, it, think of it as like it's water soluble. All right? you know, it, it get, once, it hits the, once it actually gets injected into the DOM tree, it just sort of disappears. And in its place are a whole bunch of uh, DOM nodes. Now, in this way, where we were able to improve performance in jQuery. Uh, we, we did this initially back in jQuery 1.3 when we started using document fragments, and we got some big performance improvements uh, by using this instead, especially in cloning uh, all these nodes. The additional benefit, though, that we, well, that we came to in jQuery 1.4 is that we can, oops, that we can cache these. Um, now the nice thing is that since all these, since what we now have is a relationship between an HTML string, um, yes. So now we have a relationship between the HTML string and some document fragment, and what we can do is, uh, is what we do now internally in jQuery is say, have we seen this string before, and if we have, just use the previously generated document fragment. And we're smart about it. We, we don't try to cache like a couple megabytes of HTML or something. We, we, we keep it to just small strings where that are highly uh, repeated, injected again and again. Uh, so in those cases, it, it'll speed up your code tremendously and you don't even have to worry about it. Um, so I find it to be uh, pretty interesting. And in that way, it's, this brings up another point because I find that um, a lot of times you hear people talk about uh, performance and specifically, specifically, like one way is faster than another way of, of doing things. So for example, in jQuery, uh, in, I think in 1.3, uh, you can, because you can you inject this, this fragment in two ways. Um, you know, you can do something like this, or you could do uh, something like this. So you can, you can do either of those things. They're, they're functionally equivalent. Uh, in jQuery 1.3, the first way was faster than the second way. And someone wrote an article saying that you should only use append because it's faster. Um, and that made me really angry. Um, <laughs> so I rewrote it. And now the second way is faster. Uh, um, so but, but the, the or uh, they're probably about equivalent, but the second way is definitely very, very fast. So because the advantage is, um, 
because uh, let, let's say let's take the uh, the example of you're injecting a whole bunch of dynamic content into your page, um, and you have you know a, a whole bunch of strings. Like if you're going to go through and you wanted to insert in you know 500 different strings, uh, well the, the absolute fastest way to do it would be to generate one really long string and insert that whole string in. But if you wanted to do it dynamically, you know if you're you know pulling some some variable. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that you couldn't generate, I don't know, uh, uh, um, and put in a long string. Uh, the trick is, is that it actually becomes, the, when you do this, we can't cache it anymore. Because w uh, every single string that's going to be inserted is unique. So we don't, we, we look at this and we're like, well, we can't cache that because every single one is new. But the, advantage, the difference here is that if we were to do, uh, let's say, for example, find HTML, or probably .text, foo, something like this, what this is happening is, is that this creation, this fragment creation, is being cached. So the 500 times you do it, that HTML is already pre-built, already saved, doesn't have to be generated every single time. The only thing that has to be done is find the A, insert the text, insert. Um, so in that way, you get a big speed up. Um, so th this is sort of my, my moment to say, don't listen to people talking about performance because what they recommend frequently doesn't correlate directly to your application. Nothing beats sitting down, opening up Firebug or your tool of choice, and actually analyzing the performance characteristics of your application. Because I say this now, I say that this may, this may be faster, but maybe it's not in your application. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really important to not just blindly swap all your code out for one thing or another without testing it first. So that's my moment. Um, a thing that uh, jQuery has that's really uh, quite interesting is um, it has this whole data storage API. And uh, this is something that uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of really interesting uh, jQuery developers have started to use and to build just interesting ways of building uh, web applications in general. And so what, what, this, uh, what this data storage API is, it's a way of attaching information to DOM elements that is different from attributes, okay? So, so most attributes, so like you have the ATTR method, and you attach some uh, uh, method or you know, string to an element. But the problem is, is that that information is permanently conjoined to that element. And the issue is, is that Internet Explorer has serious issues with that. <laughs> um, so Internet Explorer leaks memory all over the place, especially for attaching functions, especially for attaching functions that have closures to uh, external elements. So in this way, what, what the jQuery data store is, it's a, it's a way of attaching, uh, indirectly attaching information to an element. What we actually do is we store this information in our internal data store, and then we and then we just correlate. You know what? You know, we we give each element a unique ID, and we say this element points to this location in the data store, and never the never the two shall meet. You know they're 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 very separate, and it cuts down on leaks in that way. It also helps to improve on uh, you know garbage collection. But what an interesting side effect of this. So the jQuery uses the data API internally. We use it all over the place. And the first, the reason why we introduced the data API was to manage all these event handlers that were binding. So whenever you do dot bind, dot live, etc., we have to stick these handlers somewhere. We have to make sure they don't, they aren't leaking. Uh, so what we do is we stick them in this data property into uh, events. So what's kind of interesting is that if you pop open any web page that's using jQuery, and you find an element that is that has events attached to it and you say dot data events, you can see the full collection of all the events that are bound to it. So it's sort of an interesting way of being able to see what's going on internally in your code. Uh, you can get some more, dig in and get some more information that way. Um, jQuery has a whole bunch of different uh, uh, data things. Events is by far the most interesting one. Uh, the, the other ones are really boring, uh, like, like toggling classes and stuff like that. All right. Um, of course, you can uh, remove the data as well, but the really nice thing is that jQuery takes care of all the garbage collection for you. 
So if a user comes along and removes an element, then we will go through and make sure all the data is cleaned up as well. So you don't have to worry about that data that's living forever. We take care of it, we clean it up, and that's just something you don't have to worry about anymore. Um, an interesting thing, uh, this is something that may or may not exist in the next version of jQuery. Um, mm -hmm. If people start to use it, then it will still exist. If not, it's going to go away. Um, but we, we actually publish two events. We, uh, we have get data and set data. And these events are broadcast whenever you manipulate the data of an element. So uh, here, if you were to say, you know, dot data test five, then it would actually, it would call get, get data dot test. And in this way, what you can do is you can write plugins that actually override the default behavior for getting and setting data information. So, uh, for example, jQuery UI is using this technique. And so that you can say dot data, some property in jQuery UI, they capture that, and then actually you can go set the real property somewhere off in their, you know, their catacombs of information. Um, but the, uh, what's interesting about this is that since you can override those values, you can implement multiple different layers and multiple different plugins um, that all are trying to access and get at the same data values. And this sort of brings up the next topic, which is uh, event namespaces. Um, or, or, or I should say, well, there's data namespaces, but building on top of that is na uh, event namespaces. So what event namespaces are is if you're attaching a, a handler to an object, uh, to a, sorry, to a, a DOM element. Um, it's a way of giving a name to the handler that you're attaching. So for example, here you're attaching two different functions um, and you give it the name of plugin. Uh, probably you pick a better name for whatever you're inserting in. Um, but the interesting part here happens when you remove. What you can say is, um, since you've given both of those methods a name, you can now say remove everything that has the name of plugin. So in this way, since uh, you've given everything that uh, specific name, uh, it means that you no longer have to keep track of all those handlers that you're trying to bind and manage. Uh, jQuery takes care of all that for you. Because what, what we found happening is that when, when plugin authors were sitting down and writing uh, you know, complicated widgets and things, what was happening is that they would have to keep track of all the handlers that they were trying to bind, and then they would have to figure out when the elements were removed so that they could garbage collect it, and it was just like this whole nightmare of trying to figure out when things existed and when they didn't exist. And, but what we just did is, so we just gave, gave the ability to provide a name to something, and once we added that in, it just, it, all those problems disappeared. So uh, you may not hit this uh, immediately in your application, but if you're doing anything where multiple uh, um, let's say there's multiple interactions, like there's multiple plugins uh, interacting with a single element, or if there's multiple uh, libraries interacting with a single element, um, attaching namespaces to it is a great way to make sure everything stays very hyper-managed. So, because, the, because the problem is, is that if you, were just, if you were to say, you'll unbind click or unbind focus, you might be blowing away someone else's plugin code, or, or you might be blowing someone, another developer's code. And in this way, you can make sure that you're only removing your code, this is, you know, the specific functions that you want to remove. Um, we also have uh, the ability to bind and trigger custom events. Um, this is, uh, so, so, I mean, obviously in jQuery, we have the, all the standard events, you know, click and focus, you know, mouse move, et cetera. Um, but you can, you're not limited to just that. You can, you can say, you can bind to any name you want. And additionally, you can trigger any name you want. Uh, and jQuery just gracefully handles uh, uh, you know, the, the triggering of all the handlers that are attached. It also, it also handles all the event bubbling as well. This is something I'm going to be talking a little bit more about when I do some of the coding. But so obviously, if you have your own custom event, that's not going to trigger a default browser action. Because so, like, if, you're, if you're to... Uh, let's say, you know, a trigger of focus on an input, then the cursor will be focused on the input. But if you trigger a my plugin on an input, nothing's going to happen. It's, that's, for you to, uh, that's for you to implement. 
Um, and so again, you can also, you know, if you have custom events, uh, of course, event namespacing works with those as well. You can give namespacing to your custom events and make sure they work gracefully. Um, more complex, though, than just custom events is, in jQuery, the, uh, the concept of special events. Uh, special event is probably a very poor name for what it is. It's, it's our events API. And it's a way of implementing, at the very core fundamental level, how uh, events should work. Now, this is a way of providing a, a deeper mechanism of implementing an event. So like in jQuery uh, itself, uh, we have a whole bunch of special events. We provide it for, in this case, focus in and focus out. We provide it for um, uh, uh, change uh, and submit in Internet Explorer. We provide it for uh, mouse enter, mouse leave. So there's a whole bunch of events that we implement internally in jQuery uh, to make sure that they uh, operate how you expect uh, them to. So like for example here, uh, uh, these, so these, these are two events that we added in jQuery 1.4, focus in and focus out. And what focus in and focus out do is that they uh, will run whenever any element inside of them, so if you, if you attach it to a table, let's say, it'll uh, focus in will, will run whenever any element inside the table is focused. Okay? So this is something that's provided, actually, this is actually something that's provided by Internet Explorer. Um, there, aren't, there isn't a ton of things that Internet Explorer gets right, but some things that Internet Explorer gets right are the mouse enter and mouse leave events, those are very, very useful. Those are two that we implement. And focus in and focus out. Uh, so there's some events that um, we implement in all the other browsers. To implement them in the other browsers, what we actually do is we, uh, we actually have to attach during the, the capturing phase of uh, the event cycle. Um, but this, this is the full code to implement those events in jQuery core. It's not a lot of code to it. Uh, so that's something else that... Um, uh, is very interesting. If you see Ben Allman there, he's writing in a very cool article on special events. I'm sitting here, I'm shaming him because he hasn't finished it yet. And so if you want to, if you want to learn more about them, you should pastor him. And because it's going to be, uh, well, it, I just say, it is already very cool. If you want to learn more, pastor him. Um, okay. So, so there's, uh, and then, like, like I mentioned before, uh, submit and change events are two events that we implemented in jQuery 1.4, um, and we got those working universally across all browsers. Namely, uh, uh, working around the Internet Explorer, uh, huge issues in Internet Explorer, uh, not, not only with how the events worked, but also the fact that they uh, didn't bubble properly up the tree. And this ended, so submit actually uh, wasn't that hard. Um, uh, what we, had, we ended up having to do is we had to watch for um, uh, key presses, so watching for the users hit enter to submit the form, and when they click submit buttons, that was pretty easy. Uh, comparatively to the change event, which was ridiculously hard, and we're still battling with um, to this day, it's just, uh, we have to essentially implement the full uh, change uh, state ourselves. It's, uh, it's incredibly complicated and very frustrating. Uh, if you want to have a good laugh, read that code, because Internet Explorer is <laughs> Hilarious. Um, so building on top of that, we have, um, we have a, a event delegation. So we've had the, the live method in jQuery now since jQuery 1.3. And, you know, and that's a way of just very easily replacing your existing bind uh, uh, methods with a way of uh, capturing not only all the elements that exist currently on the page, but all the elements that will exist. And this is sort of the beauty of event delegation, because event delegation works by if, if someone clicks on a table cell or input or what have you, the event will go from that element and then bubble back up the tree again. It'll go to the parent of that element and up to that parent, up, 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 up. And what we can do is that with live and with the new delegate method, we watch for that click to occur and uh, the, what's really nice is that we only have to attach one click handler. So for example, uh, it, we could attach one click handler for a table and watch for all the clicks in every single table cell. So that way it's, it's very efficient. We can save in a lot of setup and construction time and you know, of have, being able to avoid having to bind a click to every single table cell. 
in a table. Um, so in jQuery uh, uh, 142, so it just, just came out, we added in a new uh, delegate method in addition to the existing live method. So the delegate method works uh, sort of backwards from live in that you give it a root to work from. So this is an example I gave before, and that find all the tables, and then within the tables, watch for any hover events on a TD. So, it, so it, 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 like I said, it works kind of backwards. From it, it, You would write this in live. You would say, you know, find all the TDs uh, dot live uh, hover. Um, but the, the advantage to dot delegate is that it allows you to very easily um, hook to a lower part of the tree, okay? So in this case, we're attaching the, the delegation handler to the table instead of, because in live, what we do is we attach it to the document because we don't know exactly where you want to listen for, this, for the event to occur. So delegate is a way for you to, to hyper-focus our attention to only look for events in a sp specific location on the page. So in this way, it, it, in some cases, delegate will be even faster than using a live uh, straight up. Um, and then of course, you know, we have the live events. Um, something I should mention, in 1.4, we added live hover events. Uh, so this is something new. Um, but just to show you an example here. So here, um, you can mouse over uh, elements. And just to, to emphasize the way live works is, if you, were to, if you were to run this using bind, for example, um, it would, the bind would only work on the elements that are currently exist on the page. But the fact that it's live, we can add in a new menu, and the animation will work on that new element as well. It'll work on all current and all future ones. And it's just incredibly efficient that way. Uh, jQuery 1.4, we also added in um, a new helper method called proxy. Uh, proxy is a way of changing, um, uh, uh, changing uh, the, the context of uh, the, the this of a function that's being called in jQuery. So for example, if you want to attach uh, a method of some object or some class, um, and, and you want to enforce that it's this is the original object and not a DOM element instead, uh, because since in jQuery, we override all handlers this to become the DOM element unless you use proxy. Um, so this is very similar to uh, like dot .bind you see in a prototype. Uh, and it's also in uh, the new ECMAScript 5 uh, specification. The one uh, difference between uh, proxy and bind though is that you can, proxy, you can attach a proxy, uh, but then to remove it again later, uh, to remove the handler again later, you can just say object.method. Uh, the advantage of that is that Traditionally, when you're doing dot .bind or something, you have to save that extra function that you just created in order to be able to remove it again later. Uh, and that, gets, uh, that becomes a huge hassle. And so we, we take care of that for you. Um, one thing I just want to mention really quick, so uh, jQuery uh, actually has a whole bunch of ways in which you can extend the core library. There's, there's the traditional way of writing plugins. But we also write, have a, a way for adding in uh, selectors. So you can write your own custom selectors to find, I don't know, specific elements you want to match, or, uh, such as ones that, have, that are being modified by a plugin. Uh, in that way, it, it's, it's really, quite, uh, really quite easy. Um, one thing that, this is really old actually, in like jQuery 1.2, uh, but I wanted to show it because I love it and not many people know about it. Um, so jQuery has, has the load method for loading in an external HTML page and injecting it into a DOM element. But uh, it also has a way, so, it, so you see here after the, after the file name is this uh, h2. And what you can actually do is you can specify selectors uh, after the file name. And what it'll do is it'll dig into the page that you just retrieved, extract those elements, and then inject those as directly in. So this page actually has a bunch of elements on it, but when we hit run, it actually just it grabs the page, only grabs the H2 out of the page, and injects that directly. So what I like about this is that there, you don't have to write any server-side code in order to make this work. And so it's really quite empowering, since you can just, you can just write this, and you can just literally grab, wholesale grab and rip things out of pages and inject them to your current page. 
Uh, it's re really quite excellent, yeah. So this is uh, single domain only. Single domain. Yep, and much of the uh, like that, that load is always single domain. Since the problem is is that, um, well, I should say unless you're in a browser that supports the new uh, XML issue request object, um, which is currently only Firefox. So yeah, um, but the uh, dot uh, dot load um, and so re retrieving HTML, XML, uh, JSON, we're 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 bound to only you know, follow those browser limitations. The only uh, exception is if you're uh, retrieving JSON via JSONP uh, or retrieving a remote script to execute. Uh, those are the only two cases where we can grab from a remote domain. So yeah, it's a bummer. I would love to be able to retrieve from a remote domain um, if the browsers gave it to us, but we're, we're bound to that by now. <laughs> Probably for good reason. Um, um, so just very briefly, I wanted to just uh, just, just to mention jQuery UI uh, very quickly, in case you aren't from, uh, aren't familiar with it. So jQuery UI is our collection of widgets and components that we work on, uh, and these are we we've been working on this uh, for a while now. We're we're continuing to work on it. Release new widgets. So we we provide a whole bunch of really excellent uh, components. So like a drag and drop, uh, and then all the way up to uh, more advanced things like autocomplete and dialog and things of that nature. Um, uh, one thing that uh, is really exciting is uh, the jQuery UI theme roller. And the theme roller is, if I can, hopefully the internet connection is working, the theme roller is a way of customizing the look and feel of all your jQuery, uh, uh, your all your jQuery UI widgets. And now what's, what's interesting about this, so I just want to show you. So this is, um, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but this is the theme roller, and these are all different jQuery UI components. So like we have an accordion, we have a tabs, a date picker, slider, buttons, a um, whole bunch of things. Here we have a dialogue, progress bar, etc. So in, in, the, in the theme roller, you can go through and you can pick completely different themes uh, for styling these components. So if we didn't like this grayish theme, we could pick a different one and load up that theme. So we have a whole bunch of pre-built themes to go along with this. Um, but what's even cooler is that you can actually dig in and completely customize every single aspect of these themes. So if you wanted, so like if you wanted to change the green header uh, to I don't know something orangish, uh, we could do that, and it's the uh, it's changed dynamically. But more interestingly, is that it completely uh, generates all the HTML, uh, CSS, and images that you need to get this result working, and it even works in IE six all the way up to modern browsers. Um, so what I like about this is that I hate writing CSS probably as much as you do. Um, so this is something to just remove, uh, be able to remove, abstract that away, and it takes care of all that for you, all the nasty cross-browser issues. Um, so again, yeah, and, and all the images are nicely sprited as well, so it reduces the number of downloads. So everything is, is exactly as you would want it to be. Um, so this is very cool. I, I like pointing this out since not everyone knows about it. Uh, and I always, uh, always recommend it. Um, another thing I, I like to recommend is uh, pulling jQuery off of a CDN. Now, um, a CDN uh, stands for a, a Content Delivery Network, and it's, it's really a, a way of saying um, a whole bunch of servers positioned all over the globe uh, so that they're closer to your to users wherever they might be retrieving a file. So jQuery is hosted on uh, three different uh, CDNs. Uh, we have uh, J, the jQuery project actually has our own. We actually have our own private uh, CDN, uh, which we're quite quite grateful for. Uh, Media Temple is providing that for us. That's awesome. We're abusing that very heavily. Um, but Google also hosts uh, jQuery on their CDN, and Microsoft uh, hosts uh, hosts it on their CDN. Google also hosts jQuery UI, and Microsoft also hosts the validation plugin. Um, so the nice thing about this is that not only are the files geolocated close to your users, but all the files are minified and gzipped as well. Um, so minify, minifying and gzipping your JavaScript is the absolute best way of distributing your JavaScript code. Um, what you do is, uh, I should say, distributing your code for production. The first step is that uh, you take your, your working JavaScript code and run it through a minifier. Some minifiers, we have like a Google Closure, uh, or why you min? There's there's a there's a couple different ones. The jQuery project uses a uh, Google Closure. 
uh, we, were, we were able to get a 14% improvement over YUI min uh, using Google Closure. Uh, and what this does is it strips out all the stuff that doesn't need to be shipped. Comments, white space, you know, uh, it, it makes all sorts of little uh, uh, file size optimizations before it ships the code down. So in that way, we can, we can still write nice readable code that you can read, but when we ship it, you know, in this minified version, it's nice and small. Uh, so we get the best of both worlds. And then on the server, uh, you gzip you your code. So in Apache, or you use like mod deflate, or any, any other uh, modules or servers that you might use. And in that way, so the, the, the file size is reduced even further from the minified state. So jQuery, for example, it's over 150 ki uh, kilobytes uncompressed. But when we minify in gzip, it's only about 20K. So that's a huge reduction of file size. And especially considering, you know, at least in the case of jQuery, how many you know, thousands and thousands of times it's being downloaded. Uh, so I, this is something I just, a universal that I recommend to everyone to do with your code. I'll skip that for now. Um, so this, I just want to mention really briefly the sort of things that we're working on in the next versions of jQuery. Uh, right now, well, we're working on a, a rewrite of the Ajax code. Um, this is going to this is going to make the Ajax code much more extensible, uh, allow you to write uh, plugins to snap in new ways of doing uh, uh, Ajax transmission. Um, we're also working on a way of doing uh, dynamic script loading. So this is different from uh, get script uh, that we have now in jQuery. Uh, this is a way of uh, additionally loading the scripts and doing dependency management. Um, so this is something that we're working on. Uh, we're also working on native uh, templating support, uh, so a way of doing, uh, of, uh, of having some sort of templating language baked in, but additionally being able to write templating plugins so you can write your own styles of doing templating. Um, and then, uh, most importantly, uh, we're working on mobile support. So the big thing is that uh, we want uh, the current version of jQuery uh, to not only work in all the current desktop browsers, uh, but we also want it to work in the mo the, the, all the current and most popular mobile phones as well. So what we want to be able to guarantee is that if you, uh, if you have an application, a desktop application working, and you want to load it up and have it see it work in your mobile phone, that it'll just work if you're using jQuery. Uh, we won't be able to make that guarantee for, you, for your CSS, but at the very least, we can guarantee that for your JavaScript. Um, so that is something that we're... Uh, that we're working on now. It's incredibly challenging, um, and, uh, but we, we hope it'll be a, a, a very good result at the end. So we're not looking to ship a different build of jQuery. We're not looking to ship like a, a WebKit jQuery or something. Uh, we just don't think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially considering that a lot of the original problems that existed uh, with WebKit, uh, for example, they had the issues with uh, of file size caching, a lot of that has been removed in later versions of the iPhone operating system. Um, so at least uh, for us, we think it is uh, the best use of our time to make sure that jQuery as it stands, and as we ship it on jQuery.com, will work just everywhere. Yes? Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say that it was the same thing as JQ Dutch? Is it something different? Uh, JQ Dutch is something different. Okay. So yeah, so we're just making sure that the same core library will, will work, uh, and, that, and that we actively test against uh, the major browsers. Uh, the, big, the, big, the, big decisions, the big decisions that we're, we're trying to make right now are, make, are figuring out exactly what browsers that we want to officially support. Yeah. So um, probably the, the hardest questions that we're trying to, so we're, we're definitely supporting, um, uh, we're definitely supporting the iPhone, the Pre. Uh, we're definitely supporting Fennec, the new uh, Firefox browser. We're supporting Windows Mobile, and uh, the one that we're trying, uh, we're supporting Opera Mobile, not Opera Mini, since Opera Mini doesn't have JavaScript, it's going to be kind of hard for us to support it. Um, and uh, the one that we're trying to figure out if we want to support or not is the current version of the BlackBerry browser, because the current version of the BlackBerry browser is really bad, and like, it has like, frightening bugs in it. Um, but the new version of the browser is using WebKit. Uh, so we're trying to decide, is it worth it trying to go through all this pain now? And yeah, uh, I, I, I know people who are doing BlackBerry development right now, and they're just like, why, why? So I, 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 I'd rather try to avoid, I try, I try to avoid that. I just, I just try to figure out what the life cycle is like for the uh, BlackBerry browser. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. 
Yep, so, so yeah, we're, we're just still doing all the capability testing. We, we won't be doing any, you know, browser specific. We won't be saying if WebKit, you know, it, we'll, we'll, we'll just do exactly. Um, so, and yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to be supporting uh, the WebKit, the WebKit builds on, um, let's just say the, the recent WebKit builds on Nokia. Um, oh, they're using, they're using yeah, yep. So, so Nokia has a whole bunch of different devices, um, and there's a very wide range in, in quality. Um, so yeah, we're, we're probably going to support the most capable subset. So the, the sort of the problem that we're up against here is that when we, when we target desktop browsers, we can very easily say, let's target 99% of all browsers, because that's very feasible. Um, but for mobile browsers, we may only be able to target like 75%, and even that's only five, maybe 75% of the smartphones. You know, I mean, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very different world, and I mean, we, we kind of have to take the, you know, the dish that we're given here. Um, so. So their their um, their Common JS stuff. I'm, I'm familiar with Common JS and, and what they're doing. The problem with what they're doing is that it doesn't have a direct correlation to working in the browser. Uh, a lot of their stuff uh, is expected to work synchronously, and that just does not make sense in a browser landscape. In the browser landscape, you want to parallelize everything. You want to work asynchronously all over, and it just doesn't really make sense to try and provide an API like that, uh, especially considering that we can get much better performance characteristics doing something different. Um, so we probably won't be following the, the common JS API in that regard. Yep. Other questions? Yes. The URL you showed of the code.jQuery yep. slash jQuery.js, how many lines of code are you coming up with with that canonical URL? I, we've had this URL for a while now. Um, so jQuery.js, this is the unminified one. And then if you do .min.js, that's the minified one. Um, I use that in all my projects. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out a way of doing one even shorter. Like I, wanted, I think I might set up a, a subdomain for js.jQuery.com, and that'll just serve the, the minified one straight up. Um, I think and then, because uh, we also have HTTP, I think we also have HTTPS. So you could actually leave off the HTTP and you can just do slash slash. Um, and that's what you can leave off the protocol. So if you want even less characters, you can do that. Um, when the new version goes out, is it put on that? It's put on, it's put on that first. Is there any big complaints like on IRC or just bug reports that broke my old code? You shouldn't be pulling from there if it's going to break live sites. I, I mean, in that, like, if you're, if you're pulling from this that has no version attached to it, you got to be ready for things to go. Um, um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, uh, but, <laughs> I mean, like, I, I do it in my code. I mean, um, but the, at the very least, you, um, uh, you so we have uh, uh, version specific. So, like, the way we do it is we have, um, uh, let's see here. Is there an official one-week warning or? No, nope. <laughs> just going up. So, we, I mean, we have that, we have that. Uh, Um, no difference. It, 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 we used latest initially, then I was like, why do we have latest? Let's just, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> and then, so, so like, you can, you, can point, you can point to specific versions of the code as well. Um, uh, the, the Google Ajax API, it's something like, um, it's like jQuery 1.4.2 slash jQuery.js, something like that. And then you, you can say this, to get the latest version of jQuery 1.4. Um, and then you can say this, to get the latest version of jQuery 1 point something. Um, <laughs> so th there's no way to say the latest version for any version. You know, th so when jQuery 2 comes out, whenever that is, um, uh, yeah, there's no, there, it won't transition up automatically. Um, Mm. 
So just to scroll back here, so um, it was. Oh, um, so performance-wise, they're virtually identical because all the all this is doing internally is calling dot CSS dot add class. So, I mean, it's it's not doing some crazy optimization there. Um, so performance-wise, you probably won't see any improvement. Um, it'll probably be about equivalent performance-wise. Okay. Um, uh, the only benefit I see to this offhand is simply that you can have an object from which uh, that, that you're applying to a whole bunch of different things. And maybe you just want to change this object in a slight way, but you don't want to like have to write it all again. You know, it just it makes it it makes it easy to uh, reproduce. Yeah, so uh, I mean, we've been talking about a way of doing like a, a data selector or something like that. Um, there are actually a whole bunch of data selector plugins. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't, it's something we talked about. We, we just we just haven't landed it yet, um, but it's definitely possible. Uh, we, we're, we're hoping to get more people using the data API, uh, and then once that happens, uh, we can start to make better tools for it. So um, we don't have any automated ways of doing that yet. Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it certainly is a tricky problem, since a, a lot of the things aren't necessarily quantifiable. Like, you can look at the code and be like, wow, that's not the best way to be doing that. And then you can rewrite it. Uh, but um, one thing that we've, we're, we've been talking about, so we're working on a new plugins repository. Um, and we're going to be launching it here, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. And this new plugins repository, one of the features that we're going to have is uh, a way for members of the jQuery team to be able to recommend a plugin. So a, a team member can vouch for a plugin, say, you know, the validation plugin is written by Yarn, it's awesome, I use it everywhere, you know, etc. So being and then being able to, to at least lend our credibility, I, I would hope our credibility to be able to promote good code. Um, so at least in that regard, we'll be able to do something. But at the same time, uh, but I, at least right now, we don't have any sort of way to be able to automate that. Yep. Cool stuff. I don't think J, uh, jQuery Lint, so uh, j I'll just bring it up here. So jQuery Lint is a neat little plugin that came out. Um, fairly recently, and there you go. Um, and sort of you, the idea is that you would you would run it in your your code, and it would sort of give you indication when things might be you might be doing things wrong, or you might want to, or maybe yeah, you know, it, it's sort of the linty type thing. Um, we, we, I actually provided hooks for that in jQuery one four one. I added a new jQuery error hook, so it can hook into error messages that we throw. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I think it's a better indicator of your code quality versus a plugin code quality, since a plugin doesn't necessarily always do things in the same way that user code might work. But yeah, uh, yeah, jQuery Lint's pretty cool stuff. I definitely recommend people playing around with it more so that we can get it better. So, but I wanted to do a little bit of coding to hopefully better demonstrate the, uh, um, the custom events and uh, doing uh, data attachments. Um, so one thing I, I was I wanted to build to sort of demonstrate this is I have um, sort of a, a game. So let's I'll, I'll pull up the, the completed one here. Um, uh, let's see. All right, let's reload. Okay, so it's really hard. Um, Especially with the trackpad. But to show you, so the um, these are people's icons here from the meetup, and the, so they're advancing. And you have to try and click them before they come in, um, and the bigger ones take more clicks to destroy. And I I'm really bad at it, especially with the trackpad. Like I said, um, 
They go to spam. Um, so yeah, okay, so, so this is sort of the game. Um, what, and what happens is that the, the icons keep coming in in waves, um, and the waves start to increase uh, both in frequency and in rate, uh, and in the number of people uh, that come in. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I just ran out of lives, and I was killed by Zafar Beg. Uh, Beg. Um, so the, the core code to this, uh, I wrote in a particular manner. Uh, let's see here. Um, all right, let's strip all this out. Uh, okay, so. Oops. All right, can you read that okay? A little bit bigger? All right, so this is, this is the, the code for the core of the game, the, the, the bit that um, makes the icons and has them trickle in. Um, the interesting part to this, though, is that uh, functionally, uh, so let's, um, yeah, let's kill that and let's, uh, hang on a second. Oh, sorry, I wanted to mention this really quick before the talk's done. Um, so you, you guys obviously found out about the meetup on meetups.jquery.com, but there's, the UI isn't entirely intuitive. Like there's actually a jQuery Boston group in the jQuery meetups area. And it's, they aren't like, for whatever baffling reason, it's not connected to the event. Um, so right, like right now there's actually, I think there's more people here than the entire jQuery Boston group. So. Um, if you aren't a member of the group, I definitely recommend joining it because then we'll send out updates and announcements to say, hey, we're going to do a new meetup, et cetera. So uh, definitely sign up for that. It, it, it's it's meetups.jquery.com. Um, okay, so go back to the code here. So to start, so what we have right now is just the core game logic, and it doesn't do anything. Hitting start does nothing. Uh, none, of, none of the actual gameness is working at this point. And just to show you what, what would happen here is, uh, so if, if we look at the, the actual game logic, what we're doing here is we're loading in a, a JSON file of all the people. So it's all just name and icons, uh, name and URLs. And then it's going through and it, it, it uh, iteratively adds in uh, users. But the interesting part about it is that the, the game doesn't know to actually start itself because it's, it's all done via custom events. So to show, to show you here, so like um, we attach the game to the game uh, element with an ID of game, and it's waiting for a start event to occur. And once, excuse me, once the start event occurs, then it'll start to trickle in people. Uh, additionally, uh, it waits for the stop event, and when the stop event occurs, then it you know, stops trickling in things and everything. But notice that there is no logic here for you know, maintaining score, for maintaining lives, uh, to um, you know, to actually handle you know the you clicking and destroying things like the actual gameness of it is we need to write. Um, the one thing here uh, that we so one event that's broadcast actually is uh, actually there's, there's two events that are broadcast. Here we we look for we look for any time. Uh, a mouse down occurs on one of the users that's coming in, and we trigger a hit event. Okay, so in this way we can we can look for uh, a hit event to occur, and we can assume that that was the user attacking it somehow. Um, additionally, one other event that is uh, uh, put in is that when the animation completes, so that it's, it, it animates from the right hand side of the screen over to the left hand side, and when it finally exits off the left hand side then a, 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 an escape event is triggered on that user. So those are the two events that are broadcast by the game, escape and hit, and it's listening for start and stop. So in this way, we can, we can hook in and really start to, to make things work. So just to sh show you here, uh, we can pop open Firebug, and we could, uh, we could find the game, and we could actually uh, uh, trigger a start event. And that should theoretically start the game running. Um, yeah, so we, tr so we triggered a start event, and that was enough to 
tell the game to start trickling in people. Now, nothing's, you see, nothing's happening at this point. If we click them, nothing happens. When they hit the, right, when they hit the left hand side, they just stick there. They don't know to actually disappear or anything. Um, so again, this is all, we have, we have to write that logic. We have to, we have to snap that in. Uh, so in this way, it'll, it'll just keep going indefinitely. But here, we can, we, can, we can also stop the game. So we trigger a stop. And then uh, it stops, it fades the people out, and that's it. it's just, now it's reset and ready to go again. Okay. So to start this, all right, let's see. Uh, to start writing our code, uh, we, just, we just start the way we start any jQuery code. We have in our document ready, or you use the, the shortcut passing in a function to the, the jQuery object. But to start, what we would probably want to do is actually hook up the start button to actually starting the game. Um, on this page, there is only one input, so we can be really sloppy about it. And we can just say, you know, when the input is clicked, um, uh, we're going to start the game. Um, and then, yeah, we, we can just look for the game, and we can trigger uh, the start. So uh, this is pretty simple, but we click this, and it's going to start and people will start trickling in to the left. Excellent. So now, uh, additionally, we can go, probably go through and uh, probably just, uh, the next thing we should do is we should probably start keeping track of score and life, okay? So what we can say, <laughs> um, so we can attach to the game and we can listen for uh, a start to occur. Now notice what we're doing here. This is really interesting because we're, we're listening for the start event to occur on the game. But remember that in the main game logic, we're also listening for the start, start event to occur. So this is, this is sort of the, the, the ultimate benefit of using custom events and using events and triggers in this way, is that uh, writing custom events is, is a one-to-many way of writing uh, of, of doing code. Because when you write code in a, in a class style, like you build a class and you, run, and you, and you say, you know, class.foo and you trigger some method on it, that, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. You have one foo, you're, clicking, you're, you're running one method on that foo, and that's it. The nice thing here is that um, there could be any number of start events bound to this game. We don't know how many. There could be zero, there could be a hundred. Um, but all we know is that when the start is triggered, it'll run all of those. So this is uh, this one-to-many relationship, this one-to-many way of, of running code ends up serving as a really efficient way to write complicated script. And it's a good way of abstracting logic, uh, uh, particular blocks of logic from each other. Okay, so once the game starts, uh, let's see, we're going to want to keep track of um, the score and the life, and then when the, so when the game starts, we'll, we'll reset the score um, and life. Okay, and then we should probably, we'll put that up in the uh, uh, little counters up there, um, see exactly what those are. We can use a firebug. Um, they are uh, ID of score or ID of life, incidentally. Um, that's obviously easy to do. Okay, so now when we when we start the game and we hit start, we see immediately that the life has been updated uh, at the top, and we're keeping track of that. Obviously, the, we haven't written anything to actually decrement the life or uh, keep track of score, so we gotta uh, we have to do that next. Um, one thing you should probably do first is that the the start button is still there, and uh, so if we were to click the start button, uh, we could start the, but start the game multiple times. And it's about to get very complicated here in a second um, as we see a whole bunch of them come in. Um, uh, so yeah, that, obviously we don't want that to happen. Um, um, okay, so uh, we should probably hide the input button uh, once the game starts. Oh, um, let me say input. Um, 
however you want to do it. You, one way, you, you could probably do it a different way. You could actually probably, um, you could change it into a stop button. You could, you could stop the game. That could be another way to do it. Um, I think hiding it makes sense since obviously then the t user won't be tempted to do something with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, we can, we can hide it. And then additionally, we can launch for when the, when the game ends. So we can bind for uh, the stop event. So when the stop occurs on the game, we'll, we'll show the input again. Okay. That won't come into play until later until we actually implement stopping the game. Um, so that's a good place to start. Now we should probably implement actually destroying these things that come in. Okay, so to do that, um, we, got, we remember that the, there's a hit event broadcast um, it, within the game. And the hit event is broadcast on the users themselves. So uh, what we can do is we could, we could use live events for this. We could say, watch for all the users uh, and watch for a live hit. So this, this works, uh, like, like live events work with custom events as well. Uh, it, it just it works uh, completely gracefully. So this way, we can say, you know, watch for any users that come along that get hit, uh, and we will do something about it. Um, so we actually attach, inside the game logic itself, we atta actually attach some information. So here we're constructing the user. The user, it's a, a div with an image inside of it. Um, but additionally, uh, you can see we set the dimensions. Um, but we actually attach some data to it. We, ha we have data for hits, uh, max hits, and uh, user. So user is, is the name of the person uh, that's coming in. So we can actually use this information to, uh, 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 this, this data attached to the, the element to see exactly how many times it's been clicked. So because wh what's happening is that, remember how the, the, the little guys that came in, it took one click to destroy them. The large guy took a whole bunch of clicks to destroy them, um, so and and we can just we can monitor that uh, monitor those numbers through hit and max hits. Okay, so to get to that, uh, so what we can do is we can get the data off of the off of the user. Um, so we added this in uh, jQuery 1.4, where you can say just dot data, uh, with no arguments, and that'll just return the entire data object associated with that element. And we've, what we found is that this is actually much more efficient than the traditional way uh, of, of doing, and uh, getting and setting uh, uh, data through the API. Uh, it ends up being a, a lot faster. Um, so when, when, the user, when, the, when the guy is clicked, uh, we want to increase the score. So, um, well, uh, yeah, we want to increase the score by 100. And we'll want to uh, increase the number of hits on uh, the user we just clicked. So what we need, now need to determine is if we've clicked it enough times to actually warrant destroying it. Uh, so we can say is if uh, the number of hits uh, is greater than or equal to the number of max hits. Because that, that was put in by the actual game uh, logic there. So in this case, this we, we are... Uh, we can actually destroy. Uh, we can actually destroy it now. And so, we uh, first thing we should probably do is we need to uh, stop the animation of it moving across the page. So we use the the jQuery stop method, um, and then we can just remove it. Um, doesn't have to be a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, but if the if enough wasn't done to actually warrant removing it. Um, we could probably get some uh, indicators. So the only time that uh, it won't actually be removed in that first click is in the large guy. And if you notice that when we click the large, well, I actually, you, you didn't notice because it didn't happen, but the, when you click the large guy, uh, it, the border turned right around it. Um, to do that the, in the CSS, it is hit. We, change, we add a class of hit, and the border turns red. So we'll say... Uh, So if, we bid, uh, so if we didn't bother stopping it, uh, the animation would continue. Um, it would be continuing on an element that isn't in the page anymore. 
So, um, <laughs> um, ideally, well, well, I, mean, I mean, the thing is, is that um, yeah, removing an element from the page isn't enough to just to stop the animations that are running associated with it. Since I guess presumably you can start an animation of something, remove it from the page, and then later on insert it back in and have the animation finish. I don't know why you want to do that. Um, but yeah, so we'll just stop the animation and then we'll remove it. Um, so let's see. Um, so we increase the score. Oh, and we need to we need to display the updated score. Okay. So let's reload, and we'll start the game. So the button highs, we get score zero, life one hundred, and if we click a guy, there the score went up, and it was he was destroyed, uh, and the score is actively continuing to go up, and it's going really fast, um, <laughs> and there goes Ben Allman. Um, um, and then, so, so we click Ben once, he turned red. You have to click him a whole bunch of times in order to actually destroy him. And there's Al. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so we see that that logic's working then. That, you know, that for many users, uh, we only have to click once. Uh, but note that the life isn't going away. And note that they're actually all just kind of stuck here to the side since we haven't actually removed them from the page yet. Um, so yeah, so we, got to, we have to fix that. Um, Okay, so in order to implement that logic, um, we remember that, the, that there's uh, an escape event broadcast as well. The escape event is just like uh, the hit event. It's broadcast off of the user that's traversing across. So we can do the same exact thing. We can say, look for all the users and watch for a live escape event. Um, Um, okay, so uh, and then once we're in here, we can we'll, we're going to do something very similar. We, we need to first um, uh, we need to see how much damage it's going to do, and the way we would determine the damage is so the small guys are just going to do um, well. Uh, the small guys are just going to do a minimal amount of damage, like three, and the large guys are going to do a lot, like fifteen. Um, so the way we can do that is we can get, since we have the data. Um, we can access the data again, and we can um, actually figure out um, how much life we want to remove, and we can just multiply it by uh, the number of max hits. So we can say max hits, since max hits for small guys is one, for the large guys it was five. So we can say max hits times three, and that'll, that'll, decrease, uh, that'll decrease the life. Uh, we, let's make sure it doesn't go below one, since um, Oops, uh, since that would look weird. Uh, so we say life less than zero. Let's go zero. Um, and we can update the life counter. Mm. Um. Okay, so that'll update it. And now we can work in the logic for actually when the game ends. Since the game's gonna end when we have no more life left. So we can say, um, if the life is less than or equal to zero, well, I guess we could just say if it's, uh, well, yeah, less than or equal to, yep. And we can uh, we could probably, we can trigger, if you remember back at the beginning, we can trigger uh, the stop on the game. And that, so that will trigger, that will tell the game logic to stop doing what it's doing. And it'll also, tell the, the input to show again, the button to show again, so we can start the game over. Uh, so let's give that a run. Uh, so we hit start. Um, the critters start coming in. Um, in this case, we want to let it keep going and keep damaging us uh, so that it will we'll die. Um, so OK, so the life is actually decreasing. You can see the life counter going down. Uh, and we're going to get dinged here pretty bad here in a second. Um, oh, one thing we noticed we forgot to do here is that the guys aren't actually disappearing. They're still stuck to the corner. We can, we can fix that here in a second. Actually, while we're waiting for those guys to come in, um, we can do that. So we, to remove the guy, we can just say dot .remove. And that will, that will remove him from the page. Oh, there we go. And there we go. So the game ended. Everyone, everything that's there fades out. And notice that the start button came back again. So we we can start it. We can start the game over again. 
Um, wait a second. Well, I, no, we didn't. We didn't reset the score. Um, well, we, it would re, it would it would reset the score once we hit start again. Uh, yeah, presumably if I clicked one guy, we would have had a hundred points, and that would have been obvious. But okay, so we removed. Uh, so we got to remove the people once they hit the left hand side, um, and we should also show what person actually destroyed us, because um, it's funny. Um, so we have the, the stats uh, paragraph, and we can append on. Um, um, uh, do we need a? Yeah, I'll, I think I have to give it a class because that's some styling. You were killed by. And then, um, so since we have the data object here, and the data has uh, the dot user property, and the user has the user contains the name. Of the user that uh, that we attached on, um, that would be. I think that's what we want. Yep. Did I close everything off right? Looks right. Okay. Um, some people will sometimes ask me why I use like uh, B elements instead of strong, because I like it. I don't know. I I love using center still. Uh, it breaks my heart that that's gone. I love. Um, <laughs> I love center, I love B, I, U, S, S for strike through. Those are all great elements. <laughs> I'm never getting rid of them. HTML4 forever. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's, uh, let's start the game going here. All right, so we'll have a score. And so we get, we'll just wait um, a couple of seconds so we can watch the, the damage start to come in. All right, so we can see the guys are actually removed now. They hit the left-hand side and then they go away. Which is exactly what we want. They don't. They shouldn't have to stick around uh, forever. Um, so oh, we're going to take damage really quickly here once the the big guys start to roll in. Um, yeah, we don't have long now. <laughs> and done. So you're killed by Austin J. Alexander, and it fades out. So we have a score of 100. Life is zero. And if we want to start a new game, we can just click start again. And, uh, and the next batch will come in. So we should probably remove the, the name of the person there. Um, so we can just say, uh, let's see, on, on game start, yep, we can, just, we can look for the um, uh, B, the classic hill, and remove it. And that'll remove the, that'll re that'll remove the who, who killed us at the start of the game. Oops. And we're about to die again. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me. I also have. So uh, I also have a copy online. Um, let me exit out of that one real quick. Um, let me find it. Because I'm sure some of you will probably want to try and play it. Um, uh, so he has this. Um, there we go. Um, so I have it on, online here. This is the, the completed version, and it should work. Yep. So, John, can you show us how we could change the live events on the, on the user class to the delegate event on the game? Sure. How, how, how we would? Yeah. yeah because yep. wouldn't, that, wouldn't that make more sense from, sure. from what you were telling us about sure. delegate? Yeah, so yeah, we, we could do game delegate dot user hit. And Yep, that would uh, that would have the same effect. Um, and what if we somehow su suggested that if we did that, we could then start to move all the list players? So, so the, the difference between the live one and what, what this is here is that the live is listening off of the document. So it's looking for any hit and any escape happening anywhere in the page. Here, it's only listening for any hit and any escape from that game, which is probably better anyway, since Theoretically, there could be another game on the page just doing other hits and other escapes. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, in, in general, it's probably a better idea to, to keep it enclosed like that. Yeah. This uh, event thing or, or message passing type of programming model that you're showing is really fascinating. Have you, um, like, seen any implications of using this in something like uh, Jetpack, for instance? Um, uh, some people may know mm -hmm. that. So basically, you have, like, other, you have other, Is, is this 
So I, I'm trying to remember how it, how it happens in Jetpack, but if it's anything like how it's done in like iframes and stuff, you use the you use the post message API. Um, so jQuery does not t attach into the post message API, but that's an interesting point because <clears throat> oh, that could serve as a way like if you triggered try to trigger an event on uh, a document that's in a different domain, you know we could say you know actually use post message communicate with the other jQuery process on the other side, and then trigger that event on the other side. I'd be curious to see that as a plugin. I, I, well, just just as a first go, because um, <laughs> yeah, but but jQuery does not have that baked in. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? I got questions. Yep. Now, when you have to install on that, you can invite other things that come up that are consistently running on some garbage collectors as well, or do you see that kind of in the future? Do you ever do NNL back in? Um. Yeah, so so like in remove, re like whenever you call dot remove, re we remove all the events and all the data attached to an element. Uh, if you want to get a reference to the element that has everything still intact, you use dot detach. Uh, we added dot detach in jQuery 1.4, so that gives you the elements with everything still on it. So now that now actually now that I stumbled across the issue with the uh, uh, animation still happening, but you know, even after it's been removed from the page. Maybe we'll just kill off animations when you remove it from the page as well. But just but leave them running if you do dot detach. Okay. Yes. So uh, jQuery stores that in um, uh, right over here. Uh, so jQuery has a property called jQuery dot expando, and uh, so. Like if it, on an element, so if you had some element and you said uh, jQuery.expando, that would give you the unique ID. Um, but that would only give it to you if there is a data store attached with it. We, remove, we clean this up if we don't have any data store, since we don't want to have just expandos laying around everywhere. Um, so that's one way to get it at that unique ID. Um, Any other questions? Um, I guess that's it. I think we were going to do a raffle um, because we have some books. Um, but I just want to, again, remind everyone uh, to definitely sign up for the actual real jQuery Boston meetup group since then we can actually you know, see each other again, which would be nice. Um, uh, and so we have the books donated by PACT. Um, and they're very excellent. Uh, which is the, the jQuery 1.4 reference guide? Yes. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Hold on for a sec. Yeah. All right. I want to uh, do this raffle with a little bit of a jQuery flavor to it.